Kia ora koutou, and thank you very much for that um, lovely introduction, Liv. Um, so yes, I've been asked to come and talk to you um, to give a bit of an international perspective on what other countries are doing in terms of marine protection. Um, as you can see from this beautiful picture of our planet, um, about 70% of our planet is covered by oceans. So um, just thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, why it's so important. Which button do I press to move the slide? There we go. So um, our oceans support approximately 3 billion people by providing um, their main source of protein. And um, I can't actually read my slides from here. Uh, it's a bit surprising to know that actually 90% of fisher folk are from small scale fishing communities and about half of those are women. So often we think about industrial scale fishing, but actually most of the world's fisher folk are from small scale communities. Um, the oceans play a really critical role in um, sustaining our climate and life as we know it. So we get about half of all the air we breathe from the oceans, the oxygen, um, and they absorb about 90% of the heat that we put into the atmosphere, and also 30% of the carbon dioxide. If the ocean was a country, it would have the seventh largest economy in the world. So it turns over about two and a half trillion US dollars per year. So it really is pretty important that we do our most to protect and conserve the ocean for our own benefit. Now, I was asked to um, talk to you today and be encouraging and give some hope. Um, I hope that I'll be able to do that, but I can't really do it until I first give you a little bit of despair. So um, what are we doing to our oceans globally? Well, most of this we already know. For a long time, we've been treating the ocean as a bit of a rubbish dump. About 8 million tons of plastic are dumped into it every year. That's the same as a garbage truck every minute. Um, we are deforesting mangroves and forests on land, as we've heard about a lot this week. Mangroves, I think, are rates of three to five times faster than forests. Um, and in terms of fisheries, we've heard a lot about the, um, the fisheries in New Zealand this morning, but globally, about 60% of our fisheries are fully fished, about 33% are overfished, and just 7% are unfished. And if we just look at one specific stock, the Pacific bluefin tuna, that's currently at, um, uh, it's, it's down to 97% of its, um, unfished, its unfished level. So really we have a long way to go if we are going to try and conserve this thing that actually sustains life as we know it. Now we know that um, marine protected areas are one way, and not the only way, but one really critical way that we can build ocean health. So as we've been hearing about, if we have a really effective network of marine protected areas, we can have resilient ecosystems, we can underpin sustainable fisheries, and we can have a healthy um, ocean that can then sustain us as the communities. So I thought I would talk about some of the global goals that have been set and how we're um, reaching those as an international community, and then give you a few examples from around the world as to what other countries are doing, um, and then see what we might be able to learn from that. Uh, so I think you've probably all heard that we do have these things called um, Aichi targets, which are set under the Convention on Biological Diversity, and also the Sustainable Development Goals. Now both of those, so the Aichi Target 11 and the Sustainable Development Goal 14.5, both currently call for us to protect and conserve 10% of our marine and coastal areas. Um, now those are going to be, well at least the, um, the global biodiversity framework is going to be renegotiated next year. And work is already underway and it's, I'll be very, very surprised if next year we don't have an international target for 30% marine protection. We know we need at least 30 to 40% and some scientists actually say nature needs half if we want to have those really strong ecosystems that we can depend on. So in terms of tracking how we're doing against the 10% target, you can go online, you can go to a website called protectedplanet.net and um, that is basically has all the data from the world database on protected areas. Now over the last um, sort of, especially the last 10 years, there's been a huge increase in the number of marine protected areas globally. Um, and we're currently on about 7.6%. So we still haven't reached that 10% goal globally. And as you've heard this morning in New Zealand, I think we're on about 0.4% in um, marine reserves. Um, just 2%, interestingly, just 2% of those are actually fully no-take. The rest all do allow certain types of fishing. 
And you can see from the maps, so the MPAs are in the, the dark blue color. They're mostly within the national jurisdictions of countries. Whereas actually our oceans, um, two thirds of our oceans are within international waters. So they're outside countries' national jurisdiction. And we only have about 1% of the high seas currently protected in marine protected areas. So there are negotiations going on this week and last week in New York for a new global ocean treaty, and that's for areas beyond national jurisdiction. And we really hope that what will come out of that is a framework that internationally governments can use to implement a network of MPAs in our high seas, because that's critically important. So a little ticky tour now around the world. I'm going to give you three examples. Um, one of them just popped up, actually, um, the first one. So we're going to hop to California. So um, in 1990, I think, no, 1999, um, California um, developed the Marine Life Protection Act. And this were some of the goals from the Marine Life Protection Act. And what came out of this was um, a, 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 a legal um, goal to reach and then a kind of a bottom-up process. So the California coastline was divided into five regions. And within each of those five regions, they brought together all of the different stakeholders um, and they had collaboration hubs. And they used science to design a network of marine protected areas along the entire coastline from Oregon all the way down to Mexico. So this is actually the longest um, and only in the USA, the only national network of marine protected areas across the whole state. So they created about 120 marine protected areas. And I'm just going to show you, um, I'm not sure if you can see on the, your left, this is before and then after. The little blue and red dots show the different marine protected areas that they had to start with. And then you can see that those areas have got um, bigger and um, some of them closer together. So basically they followed some of the network design principles, which are things that include um, representing all the different habitats that are there, including particularly um, important areas and having connectivity between the MPAs, so ecological connectivity. I think they've now got about 16% of that coastline covered in some sort of MPA, um, but they're not all no-take. So these are some of the different types. The strictest one is the state marine reserve, which is fully no-take, and then they have state marine parks, which have no commercial take, but do allow certain types of recreational fishing, and then you can see there's another two types of marine protected area. Um, early on, they did report positive results from this. So um, PISCO and the Collaborative Research Group, they reported um, higher abundances and diversity of species within some of the marine protected areas. Um, but they also reported really good um, uh, outcomes that weren't necessarily just for the fish species themselves, but for the people who live in those areas. So the recreational fishing community, who were initially quite opposed to the MPAs, but once they got involved in actually monitoring them, um, they started to really see the benefits. So this is a quote from one of those fishermen. It was breathtaking to see the water column literally stacked with fish. Every hook in the water caught a fish. We had to stop fishing to let the scientists catch up with the tagging. It's what you hope will happen all over. So that's a really positive story of how engaging the fishing community in the science actually led to a stronger buy-in and, and, um, and perception of the MPAs. And of course, they were reaping the benefits as well. Um, also on the left, you can see the school kids. So the school kids are involved in beach cleanups. They have education programs. And they're actually advocating for the MPAs because you know, they understand that it's their future that they're um, helping to protect. Okay, so now we're going to fly across the Pacific Ocean to the Republic of Palau. I am one of few people that's been lucky enough to go to Palau and to dive there. Um, actually, I didn't. I was pregnant, but I snorkeled there, and it was still an amazing, um, amazing underwater life in Palau. So they have something like, uh, I think, uh, one of the highest... Um, they're one of the most... Um, have the highest endemism of marine species, and there's a huge amount of dive tourism that goes there. So they're made of about 200 of these beautiful lush um, islands surrounded by an aquamarine lagoon. 
Now, they have a traditional um, history of protection, such as, um, as do many indigenous cultures, um, but they're also a very strong nation in terms of being leaders in marine conservation. So they established the first shark sanctuary, they've got really stringent rules on bottom trawling, and um, as you'll see, they've been very bold in what they've set for their marine protection goal. So back in 2003, they actually created the Palau Protected Areas Network, this is a network of, it's a scientifically designed network of marine protected areas around their islands. And they created that because they were seeing some of the impacts of climate change, coral bleaching, other events that were damaging some of their reefs. And they, they really um, implemented reef resilience principles to have a resilient ecosystem around their islands. Um, so that's resulted in about 35 marine protected areas covering around about 20% of their um, coastal areas around the islands that they live on. Um, and then, in 2015, um, the government established the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, sanctuary and they've protected 80% of their entire exclusive economic zone. So there's no fishing and no mining in 80% of their entire ocean area. And that's partly because they recognize the value of tourism. They have a population of 20,000 people, and they get about 160,000 tourists every year. So this was a massive issue, actually, for how they manage that tourism, but also a massive opportunity that they didn't want to lose by not managing the environment. Um, so the area that you can see that's open into the, um, actually, into international waters, that does allow traditional fishing, and as of recently, um, they've decided that it will allow some types of commercial fishing as well from the Japanese vessels. So Palau is a world leader in many ways, and they developed something called the Palau Pledge. I don't have time to show you this video, but I do recommend Googling it. Um, it's a beautiful video that's played on every, um, every in-flight that comes into Palau, and it shows how they want people to behave when they're in their country. Um, and when they get there, everybody who arrives gets a stamp in their passport and they have to sign a declaration to talk about how they're going to act around the environment and around the culture within Palau. So they were the first nation on earth to change their immigration laws for the cause of environmental protection. Um, and they've also established the Palau Pristine Paradise Environmental Fee, which is $100 on every ticket for everyone who comes into the country. And that money is then used to um, implement the marine protected area to be able to monitor it and have enforcement and those kind of things. Um, just to show you the kind of things, because I think it's quite interesting, so every visitor has to sign to say that they won't stand on the corals, break the corals, um, feed the fish, um, they won't take shells away, but also that they won't... Um, they will get others to respect the culture, and that includes, as an example, not taking flowers or fruits from people's gardens, because that's deeply offensive in Palauan culture, and a lot of tourists obviously had no idea, so they were causing offense by behaviors that, because they didn't understand that it was offensive. So this is really about um, respecting the culture as well as the environment. Okay, so finally I'm just gonna um, talk about the Cook Islands. It's a bit closer to home. Um, you may have heard about Marae Moana, so sacred ocean. Um, in 2017, the Cook Islands legally declared its entire EEZ as a multi-use marine park. Um, so currently, they have a 50 nautical mile exclusion zone around each of their islands. And within that exclusion zone, there's no commercial fishing and no mining. So they still do are able to carry out recreational fishing and traditional fishing. Um, it is the largest commitment by a single country for integrated management, and they are adopting a ridges to reefs and reefs to ocean, so a whole landscape, seascape, oceanscape approach, um, as we've heard, is really necessary this morning to be able to manage all of the threats. So it's not just about the fishing, it's also about the land-based threats that are impacting the ecosystems. Um, so certain types of development will be, allow will be allowed, um, but they need to be sustainable and not detrimental to the marine environment. Um, they're currently working out the zones, and it is taking time because although they've set, again, a top-down mandate, they're doing it through a very much a bottom-up approach. And what's really critical um, for them is that the communities have ownership of this, and so they've worked really hard to ensure that. 
Um, so they've set a Marae Moana Council, which is the high-level group that oversees everything. They have a technical advisory group and a coordination office, which you can see here as their secretariat. As I said, transparency and ownership is key. So they've had a group of traditional leaders, governments, and NGOs um, going from island to island. And in some cases, you know, they have to travel by boat, so it's taken them a long time to really figure out exactly how they're going to do this and where the zones are going to be. But they do um, envisage that they're going to have some no-take zones, um, some areas for a certain species to be protected at certain times, um, and protecting turtle nesting beaches, that kind of thing. They've also used an ambassador, so Kevin Iro, he's a famous rugby player, so he's been the ambassador to help get buy-in for um, local communities into this. So um, what can we learn from looking abroad? I think there's actually been a theme that's come across through all of the talks this morning, is that it's really good to have that, um, those goals set at a high level, whether it's through legislation or through um, just um, getting a, a commitment for what it is that you actually want to achieve, but it's really helpful to have that at the highest level and then go through a bottom-up approach to be able to meet those goals. Um, Definitely you need to be guided by science and we've looked at some very science-based networks versus kind of the opposite end of the spectrum But I don't think you should be restricted by science So you can be bold and you can innovate in this space and I think that New Zealand and the Haraki Gulf um, Region has the opportunity here to really look at the local context and figure out what's going to work here And how you can be leaders both within Aotearoa, but also overseas so Hopefully that's a bit encouraging, and thanks for the opportunity. And if you do want to um, speak to me later, that's fine, or here's my email if you'd like to get in touch as well. Thank you.